I'm Rob Trasinski. This is Symposium, where we talk about the ideas at the basis of a free society. My guest today is Nathan Beacom of the Lyceum Movement. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Rob. All right, so explain to me what the Lyceum Movement is and what the inspiration is for this idea. Yeah, the Lyceum Movement is a revival of a tradition that goes back over 150 years in America. So the original Lyceum began on a farm in Connecticut, a farmer named Josiah Holbrook, who had the idea that um, lifelong learning and big ideas and philosophy, history, art didn't just belong to the upper crust people who could get it at Yale or Brown, but um, belonged to mechanics and farmers and all kinds of people. And so he started the Lyceum, uh, the name taken from the ancient Lyceum of Athens um, on his farm. And that movement. So, so I think it's interesting, though, that, you know, symposium sort of we're coming from taking our name from from Plato. You're taking your name from Aristotle. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that became really successful. And there were thousands of Lyceums by the middle of the century. And uh, as and one historian said, you know, every little village had a Lyceum hall where people would come to learn uh, about these topics. Um and so it was a big part of our public culture for a long time, uh, and it kind of faded away with um, the spread of mass media and and time social media. Um, and we kind of see some of the damaging effects of having all of our conversations on those platforms and not getting in a room eye to eye, face to face, and, and talking about big ideas that way. And so uh, that's what we're that's kind of the basic uh, elevator version of why we're reviving it today to get people back in a room with their community to have those real conversations. Right. So that that's the historical part, but let's talk about the the specifics of, of what you're doing. What does that mean, you know, in concrete application? Yeah. So, so kind of like the historical movements, what we do is we create spaces for communities to hear from the most interesting thinkers, writers, leaders, or just people who have interesting stories in their community. Um, so we bring people together to hear about those kind of topics I mentioned. Um, and then we have people engage in those topics over food and beer together. So we host panels and conversations and reading groups uh, across now seven cities that are part of our our, our network of chapters. Well, what I find kind of interesting is, is which cities those are, because you're based in the Midwest. It's, you know, uh, centers, uh, well-known centers of, of learning and, and intellectual discourse like Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> yeah, Des Moines is really, a, I call it the Florence or the Oxford of, uh, of Iowa, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, really... I, I, I'm, from, I'm from the same, much, much the same region, sort of on the Illinois side of things. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, I like the fact, though, that it is not just something that's like, you know, in the coasts in the big cities. It's something that is, as in the original version of this, is is spread out in, in the heartland, so to speak. Right. And there are kind of these um, the public dialogue movements that have come from D.C. or come from universities. And, and they don't usually succeed because they are coming from outside the community with this idea of crafting some solution to a community problem. Uh, but historically, like you said, these grew up from up within communities, out of the community's own desire to have a place to learn and talk about these things together. And I think that's really where the magic is. Yeah, so uh, I want to talk about this. You mentioned that people talk about things differently in person than than they do, especially in online spaces. So what I want right. to talk about that, what what effect, you know, what I, I actually you I see that on, on your site, you have rules for a civil discussion that ways to sort of set the table and get people to talk in a productive way. Yeah, so we are not trying to just replicate the toxic ways that we communicate online. I think people are probably pretty familiar with what those are. And and part of that coming from being disinhibited because you're behind a screen and you don't actually know that person, you're not having to encounter them physically as a human being on equal footing. Um, and, and you're not going to have to encounter them, phys encounter them again. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to have to see them at the grocery store later or at like your kid's soccer game or whatever. Um, so it creates this just, yeah, this environment where other people are abstractions and the gloves are off and it's just, uh, you know, winner takes all. And in person, uh, that encounter physically in the room and in your own community, it, it forces you to kind of moderate your own ideas, receive pushback, pushback on theirs. 
Um, and the conversations end up being a lot richer. And we have those habits, uh, those six habits that we kind of affirm in, in our conversations that set the stage that this is going to be a different type of place. We're going to be uh, generous and give each other the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we're yeah, gonna try spell, spell out what the six habits are. Six yeah, habits well, of, of civil discussion. Sure. Um, let me see if I can say them off the top of my head. Um, but they have to do with uh, reading whoever you're talking to, read their words in, in the best light. You want to you want to take the strongest version of their argument, not not a straw man or a weak version of whatever they're saying. Um, you want to think of yourself as fundamentally on the same team at the end of the day with the people you're talking with, even if you disagree. Um you want to look for something positive, just something to love or affirm about the person you're in conversation with um, in order to kind of see their their humanity and to talk for the sake of truth and not winning. You know, at the end of the day, we you win in a conversation if the two of you have learned and come closer to some some knowledge together, not if somebody beat the other person. So these are the kind of principles that uh, that shape our conversation and end up being really refreshing for the people who participate in them. You know, that, that last point about talking for the sake of knowledge uh, uh, rather than winning is, I think, the the one that is the biggest differentiation to the online space, where right. it often seems like, you know, on online, it's, it's a game where people are trying to score points. You have to own the other guy. Uh, right. And, and uh, you know, where the successful resolution is that you come out looking, being able to thump your chest and say, oh, look, I really put that guy down, rather than the successful outcome being, I changed somebody's mind. Right, right. Or that I understand the other person better, or we've both, you know, there's there's some sociological studies too about when you get people physically in a room together uh, versus online, and you you almost always come away when you're in person with saying, hmm, you know, that person, your mind might not have been totally changed, but that person had a point about this or that, um, which is not the way it tends to work on on Twitter or <laughs> what have you. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question though about the impact of technology on discussion and how how possible is it to sort of turn back the clock to the way people interacted in person before we all had these you know the the, the all of the world chattering in our in our pockets and these little devices. Yeah, so and it's not to say that you know there were that people interacted perfectly at any time or that in person interaction is always going to be pleasant and awesome um but the just the incentives of of social media um play into some of our worst impulses um and i think there is a, a sense of tiredness with that um we're getting to the point where it's starting to get a little old and that people are looking for another way to have conversations and and not to be so isolated and, and just a, a keyboard warrior. So, uh, well, and, might... and also a lot of people are not online all the time. I mean, you know, you go to the right. online space, there's a lot of debate happening, but it's happening among a very a relatively small subject subset of the people. There's right. most of the public is not, is either they're online, but they're more concerned about following their, the, their favorite celebrity and not concerned about politics or big ideas, or they're just repulsed by the kind of conversations we have. And they go offline. So there's a huge reserve of people who are not extremely online. Right. And it's good for those people and the online people to be talking together um, to realize the world is bigger than than your your pocket online. Yeah. So the other thing I think that maybe working towards you, too, is is what I've, I've been hearing a lot recently about what they call Zoom fatigue, which is this idea that, you know, after after was there three years now into the pandemic and especially in the first year or two years. We were all spending a lot of time doing meetings uh, by looking at, as we're doing right now, looking at a little picture of a person on a screen uh, rather than being in person. And I, I've heard you know people saying that you know, it's actually hard to get people to voluntarily come to a Zoom event. Yeah. Uh, it's much easier to get people to come to something in person. Uh, so people talking about like uh, organizing events on campus. If you're trying to get students, mm -hmm. don't try to get them to do anything on Zoom. They're sick and tired of that do something in person and they'll actually show up. Yeah, I think COVID really showed that when people had to, when the whole life went on to Zoom, people realized, okay, this is not the same thing. Useful tool, but it's not the same thing. Um, and uh, I think that really does play into the favor of the kind of thing we're doing is that that really made people realize, okay, 
just digital life is not a substitute. And so we get the people who come end up just being like, wow, this is, I just wish there was more of this, more opportunities to do this. I, I've just been waiting for this and I didn't even know it. Um, Cause it's just a, a, a richer thing to be in a room with somebody. You know, you know what, the other thing I was thinking about is that uh, one of the trends that's happened, I think has been fed by the technological change has been the nationalization mm-hmm. of American politics and American discourse that, you know, we're all arguing about what's going on in Florida right now. And, you know, I'm not in Florida, you're not in Florida, uh, or, you know, the, the latest outrage that have, you know, something event that happens some very, where very far distance becomes the latest outrage. Everybody's talking about that. And nobody could tell you who's running for the school board in their own local local district, right? right. So, uh, and you know, it's because you're, you're watching cable news and you're on the internet, and all these things from distant places that are emotionally grabbing can come grab your attention, and the resources for somebody to report something that's happening, you know, uh, a mile away from you, is, is much less. Right. So. Do people talk uh, not just in a different way, but talk about different issues when they're gathering, you know, locally with their neighbors? Yeah, and we try to intentionally foster that as an alternative because, you know, if if you don't live in Florida or California and you're hearing all about the controversies all the time, it's not really within your power or responsibility to pay so much attention, you know, because uh, you don't have the power to affect it, and so. When you are so wrapped up, when we are so wrapped up in these national controversies, I think it just stresses us out. I think it just makes us more anxious and jittery people. Um, Whereas if you talk about the local type of thing where it's not so heated usually, and you might actually have a possibility of doing something, of having some effect on it, that's a more empowering and and fruitful experience. So, um, and people are interested, they, you know, like you said, they just might kind of lack the resources uh, because local papers are dying and things like that to know about it. But people are interested in that stuff uh, and want to talk about it too. Yeah, there's a lot of, I, I encountered a lot of political burnout where people are like, well, I feel like I can't do anything. Nothing I do makes it, you know, I'm, I'm just one person, you know, the, all the decisions being made off in DC, I can't have any impact. Mm-hmm. But people, I think, would have a very different approach to politics if they were focusing on the things where you actually can have an impact. You know, you look, show up yeah. to a, a local planning council meeting or a school board meeting and you know there's there's 12 right. people there. You, know, <laughs> you are going to have a much bigger impact there than, you know, if you're trying to tell Congress what to do. Um, right. You know, you know, I part of the history of the Lyceum movement, as I understand it, too, is it was it was a major center for certain kind of reform movements, including a major center for debate over questions like slavery, you know, in, in the years before the Civil War. So I guess the question I would say is, you know, historically, this was used to debate some very, very, not just local issues, but some very, very big issues. And right. you talked about debating, you know, sort of fundamental, like big ideas, fundamental ideas, you know, the Lyceum, the, the, going down to philosophical ideas. So what do you see as the issues now that that you're talking about or that people want mm-hmm. to talk about? Yeah, I, and and the tone of it, historically even, mm-hmm. it was kind of more philosophical, even when they were talking about those things. So it wasn't partisan debates or debate about this bill or that bill. Uh, at the Lyceum, it was that big ethical question about slavery in our society. Um, and like you said, that was that conversation produced sort of a change in at least in the northern part of the country of the way people thought. I seem to recall um, that that uh, uh, Lincoln gave a famous speech at, a, at uh, one of these Lyceum uh, organizations. Yeah, his, his first ever public address at the Springfield Lyceum, um, which is kind of a well-known speech that, that people should read. Um, yeah, and Frederick Douglass and all sorts of folks were Lyceum speakers. Um, today, I think, you know, there's a whole host of questions uh, that aren't necessarily like policy questions, but uh, one example would be, you know, what's the relationship between self-care and self-love and selfishness? You know, that's kind of a, a an idea that's floating around in our society that's worth interrogating uh, the effects that it has on us or um, or questions about how media affects us and what it's doing to our brains or questions about what AI is going to bring to the world. Um, and those give us a chance to talk about things that kind of we're all thinking about and concerned about in that deeper philosophical way. 
So in, in the title of the organization, it says Lyceum Movement, which implies, you know, not just one place, but uh, trying right. to expand it. So what do you see as the the things you're doing to uh, to expand this, to sort of bring this idea onto the road and maybe get it to go beyond uh, beyond the Midwest? Yeah, well, like I said, we have our, our seven cities in the Midwest, and that's mostly in virtue of that being where I'm from and and it being a grassroots thing. Um, and historically, the Midwest has just kind of culturally been very eager to adopt stuff like this. Um, but ultimately, I'd love for this to continue to grow across the country. I think, you know, every kind of community can benefit from it, uh, as was the case historically. Um, and so, yeah, people, if people are are interested in different parts of the country, we, we welcome them to reach out uh, as well. Yeah, give your site and talk about what kind of resources you have there for somebody who might be interested in, in doing this. Yeah, so it's it's lyceummovement.org. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's spellable, <laughs> L-Y-C-E-U-M, movement.org. Um, and we have- And I'll, by the way, and I'll post a link when I, when I, when I give this, uh, when we post this uh, podcast. Great, great. Yeah, and so you can find there just our history, our our mission, our theory of what we're doing um, and what we have been up to so far. You can find our podcast, um, and then there'll be uh, a way to contact if you're interested in kind of exploring the option of a of a chapter in your your community. You can just shoot an email there. Yeah, great. Because I think you know, I think one thing people will need is sort of a a toolkit or a a a model for like okay here's here's how we did it here here's how we found a space here's how we got the word out here's how we found people to talk etc and and because right. you know it, it the 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 problem with this is that you know when you the reason everything's been nationalized and everything's gone on the internet is that you know you have people you know when you're dealing something nationwide you have somebody who has more likely to have the resources and the motivation and the time to right. put something big together. Whereas, you know, people and, and somebody operating on a more local air, uh, um, scale is going to have less time and less resources, maybe less knowledge of how to organize. And so having, you know, some guidance for how you can go about, you know, doing this, how to, how to jumpstart something like that, uh, I think can, can be useful. Uh, so what kind of, you know, what kind of results have you seen in terms of your personal experience with this? Yeah, um, I think that's right. As far as how, how we fostered the new chapters and we've, we're learning all the time about how to, um, what works best and how to technically assist in that way. And, you know, as, as these community organizations have faded over the last several decades, uh, it's kind of public life has become professionalized and volunteers have drawn back. And so we really want to facilitate that, uh, that volunteer community ownership type of thing. And, and fortunately so far we found great local leaders who are willing to do that and are up to the challenge. Um, sorry, I spoke to kind of your prior question and, uh, I got sidetracked from your, your actual question. Well, I think the actual question oh. was your personal experience. Yeah. Results. Um, well, like, like I said, um, some of the the best things and i've had the good fortune of being able to go to lyceums across our various communities and that's in a town as small as jefferson iowa with four thousand people or or the twin cities minnesota which is a pretty substantial metro um and that you find people with with fascinating perspectives um interesting stories to share and who are really hungry for this type of conversation um and that across these communities which seem very different people are so so eager for it um when we started out people you know said that it, we're too apathetic today people won't come and it's been really encouraging to to see continued growth uh as we as we continue to move forward well i wish you i wish you uh good luck with that um you know and the interesting thing is that uh it kind of reminds me a little bit about the early days of the internet. Sort of the promise of that was hmm. that you got people, and I'm thinking sort of like the early blogging era is that you got people who were not, you know, it was not professionalized. They were, they were people who were not, you know, professional uh, pundits or not professional political operatives. They were people with regular day jobs who had, but they had often fascinating perspectives, interesting things to say. Mm -hmm. And because you, anybody could start a blog, you suddenly could find these people. And I think right. what happened as, you know, the internet got bigger and more prominent as social media became came to take over and you had these algorithms propagating engagement 
is that you sort of we went the other direction is that the people who were uh better at sort of mobilizing outrage or mobilizing emotions predominated and uh the people who were you know people with regular day jobs who were not political obsessives who who had interesting perspectives those people you didn't hear from them as much or they got you know they got drowned out right yeah and i think i think it's important to foster a culture which can be a difficult thing to do on on some kind of online platforms but but some, you know, certain online uh, communities or outlets manage to foster better, better cultures of engagement. And so that's what we hope to do in, in the in-person way. And, and hopefully some of those risks that come with, you know, every time you tweet or post an article, the goal is to get the feedback of the most likes or the most retweets. And that, that really incentivizes, like you said, the outrage, um, the outrage cycle. Well, I, I wish you luck with trying to sort of change that culture from, from the bottom up. Thanks so much for coming to talk to me. Yeah, thanks so much, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I'm Rob Trusinski. My guest today has been Nathan Beacom of the Lyceum Movement. If you enjoyed this conversation, please hit like on YouTube or uh, subscribe to us on your favorite pub- podcasting platform. And you can always find more discussion of the ideas at the basis of a free society at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.